Welcome to our author presentation this evening at this House of Books. This evening we have with us author Greg M. Peters, who will be talking about his latest book titled Our National Forests, Stories from America's Most Important Public Lands. Greg is a freelance writer who lives in Missoula. His writings can be found in numerous magazines and journals. Also, he has two books. Besides his new book, Our National Forests, he is author of A Falcon Guide, Stand Up Paddling Montana. There's been a lot of interest in this event, so I will be recording it and we will post it online. Check our This House of Books Facebook page for availability. I'm going to ask everyone to mute your microphones. If you have a question or comment, please type it in the chat area. Note that everyone will see it. And at the end, when we have questions, I'll read the questions and Greg can answer. Okay, I'm just gonna get out of the way and let Greg introduce himself and talk about his book. Take it away, Greg. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm really excited to be here and to get a chance to uh, chat with a bit more of a local audience, although um, there are some miles between Missoula and Billings um, about this book, um, and particularly an audience that's probably a bit more familiar with National Forest than some of the other audiences that I have had the chance to, uh, to do this presentation with. So um, I do have a presentation um, <clears throat> and I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, so that folks can see that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what national forests are, kind of do an introduction there, um, a short little bit about their history and, and how they came to be. Um, and then I'm going to talk more specifically about the book and some of the chapters in the book and some of the topics and stories that I cover. Um, as Mark mentioned, the book is out now. It's available as of last week. Um, Obviously, this house of books uh, has some copies, so you can get some locally there. Um, if uh, if there's a mad rush and they sell out, it's also available online at all those major retailers too. So um, I'd much prefer you buy it locally if you can, and uh, and have Mark order some more if if they do run out. Though I'm <laughs> I'm not I'm not super confident that will happen. Um, but anyway, thanks so much for joining us. Um, let's get started here. I'm going to share the screen, and uh, we will get rolling. Okay. So again, uh, as Mark said, I'm Greg Peters. Um, I live here in Missoula and um, I love our national forests. I, I spend a lot of time on them. Um, these three photos here uh, sort of are, illustrate what I like to do. Um, I'm a big backcountry and cross country skier. That's my dog Murphy, who's out with me. Um, I do a lot of backpacking. Um, and I was able uh, a few years ago to do an amazing trip uh, in the Bob Marshall Wilderness, uh, pack rafting on the South Fork of the Flathead River. Um, I do a lot of paddling, as Mark mentioned as well, and uh, was, was really fortunate to be able to write a, a paddleboarding guidebook to Montana too. So um, I want to focus on this book, uh, obviously, for tonight. But um, yeah, so. <clears throat> um, I, I like to start these presentations with with just a bit of an overview about what national forests are. Um, a lot of folks um, don't have a, a great understanding of what this set of public lands are, um, and so I want to I want to start there. And, and that was one of the big motivations for writing the book. Um, I, I had the privilege of working at the National Forest Foundation for about eight years, from 2010 to 2018. Um, and I ended up as their communications director for the last five or six of those years. And um, one thing that we found uh, when we were talking about folks, um, whether they were donors or, or new board members or just whomever, really, was that uh, the understanding of national forests was, was a little limited by and large. So um, when I had the opportunity to write a book about them, um, I was really excited because I wanted to, to try to share a little bit more about, um, about these landscapes and and, and their history and, and I think their, their possibility for the future. So um, obviously national forests are public lands. Um, they're owned by the federal, well, they're owned, they're owned by all of us. They're, they're in the federal estate. Um, they are managed by the US Forest Service. Um, they are multiple use lands. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in depth in just a moment. Um, and they're incredibly diverse. And that's another thing that I really wanted to get across in this book. And the book has close to 150 photographs in it. Um, many of them are sort of your traditional scenic landscape photos. Some are historic, um, others are particular to or, or specific to a particular chapter or topic. Um, but one thing myself and the publishers at Timber Press really wanted to do was include all of these photos to highlight that diversity and just that scenic grandeur that these uh, these lands provide. Um, and so I'm gonna, as I move on in the presentation, you're gonna get a chance to see a lot of those photographs because all the photos in this presentation are from the book. Um, and obviously if you get the book, um, you'll be able to, to uh, <clears throat> own your own uh, matte version of those photographs as well. Um, 
So I mentioned that national forests are multiple use lands. Um, that's not a super common term. So what does that mean? Well, they're managed for multiple uses. They're managed for things like natural resource development. So timber harvesting, oil and gas development, even hard rock mining is something that happens on national forests. Um, they're managed for grazing, cattle and sheep graze, um, huge swaths of our national forests. And in fact, um, according to the Forest Service, uh, I think close to 80 or 90 million acres of the national forest system, which in told is uh, all told is 193 million acres. Um, about 80 or 90 million acres of that is considered rangeland. So it's a huge component of the system and it's a big use of the system as well. Um, <clears throat> clearly our national forests are managed for recreation. Uh, I just showed three photos of myself recreating on national forests and probably most of the folks uh, not with us tonight um, know our national forests through, through recreation in some form. Um, and that recreation kind of covers the whole gamut from motorized to non-motorized to, to wilderness, um, you know, where you can't even bring a mountain bike uh, and, you're, and you're limited to horseback or foot. Um, our national forests are managed for wildlife and fish habitat. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, and one thing that I think um, is really, really crucially important that a lot of folks probably don't understand or don't know as much about is how important our national forests are for water provision. Um, and in the, the second chapter in the book, um, or maybe it's actually the first chapter in the book, um, goes back into the history of the Eastern forests, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and how those were created specifically to protect water supplies. Um, but even today, 68 million Americans, according to the Forest Service, get their water directly from a watershed on a national forest. Um, and that may be subsurface, it may be surface, but nonetheless, those national forest watersheds protect and provide that water for almost one fifth of our entire population. And uh, th those are in, in small communities, huge cities, um, east, west, Atlanta gets a lot of its water from uh, the national forest near it. Um, obviously, you know, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Salt Lake City, Denver, those cities as well. Los Angeles gets about 30% of its water from the Angeles National Forest, um, which is a statistic that I think surprises a lot of folks who, who may know a little bit about Western water. We tend to think it comes from the Colorado Basin, um, but in fact, 30% of the, of the 15 or 30% of the water that's provided to those 15 million people that live in LA uh, comes from uh, the Angeles National Forest, just to the east. <clears throat> um, and then, of course, there are other ecosystem services, carbon storage, um, flood control, pollution control, um, the, you know, those types of things that, that our national forests provide as well. So stepping back a little bit, um, in order to understand the history of our national forests, particularly here out west, you've got to kind of understand a little bit of the history of what happened to forests in general in the United States uh, in the 1800s, um, up, early 1800s up until the later 1800s. Um, this photo from the book shows a bunch of logs stacked um, from Michigan. Um, for uh, several years in the late 1800s, Michigan was the largest producer of lumber in the U.S. Um, huge white pine forests up there in Michigan and Wisconsin. Um, I think Wisconsin replaced Michigan uh, pretty quickly after Michigan was depleted. Um, but most of these eastern and midwestern forests were privately owned <laughs> and uh, they were pretty ravaged by industrial timber harvesting. Um, obviously, uh, you know, this is a pretty huge stack of logs. I feel kind of bad for those two horses there who've got to haul these. But um, nonetheless, I, I want to start with this slide to help provide some context for how the Western forest uh, kind of came to be. And then again, we'll circle back and get more to those Eastern forests as well. So in the East, these forests were ravaged, um, all private land. There wasn't much public land in the East at the time. And so, as America moved west, and as uh, after the Civil War, as we took control of Native American lands and uh, you know created reservation systems for the Native Americans, there was this huge amount of land that was called basically the public domain, and it was land that the federal government owned um, that hadn't yet been given to homesteaders or given to states or territories. Um, obviously, states have their own you know state trust lands. We have, certainly have those here in Montana, um, and it hadn't been uh, sold to land speculators or private industry or anything. So a huge set of public lands, and uh, starting in 1876. Um, the Department of Agriculture recognized a need to assess the condition and sort of extent of those forests. So it did that. Um, 
In 1891, Congress passed the first um, law that, that really started the formation of national forests, and it was called the Forest Reserve Act, and it authorized, uh, it didn't author, it authorized, I think I have a typo in here, the president to, uh, to designate public lands in the West as forest reserves, um, and several presidents did that starting in 1891. Um, fast forward to 1905, so uh, what is that, eight years later, uh, President Teddy Roosevelt uh, signs the Transfer Act, which is where we really see the formation of the national forest system that we start to know and that we have today. Um, that 1905 Transfer Act created the Forest Service, and it moved the management of those forest reserves from the Department of Interior, where they had been managed uh, to date, to the Department of Agriculture. Um, the that first Forest Service in those early days was led by Gifford Pinchot. He was the first chief of the Forest Service. He was a friend of Teddy Roosevelt's, um, has an interesting backstory. He was pretty wealthy. He was from Pennsylvania. Um, his family uh, was a wallpaper uh, family. They made a bunch of money on wallpaper. So sort of an interesting, uh, I don't know if it's an irony, but an interesting um, paradox in some ways that Gifford Pinchot, the head of the Forest Service, first chief of the Forest Service, came from a family that made all of its money from paper and from trees, obviously. Um, in 1911, we see the Weeks Act come into play. And the Weeks Act is named after a gentleman named John Weeks. He was a legislator from Massachusetts, originally from New Hampshire. And he wrote and passed, uh, wrote, wrote the Weeks Act. It was passed into law in 1911. And that act authorized the federal government to purchase lands from private landowners who were willing to sell those lands. That's the first time we saw that in American history. Prior to that, federal government could only take land from that public domain that I mentioned earlier, um, at least as far as I understand. Um, the way that Weeks was able to get that act passed and, and, and to find the legal footing for it was through the Interstate Commerce Clause of the, of the Constitution. And the hook was, because of the deforestation that I had mentioned in these forested watersheds, downstream communities were suffering terrible flooding, they were having disease and pollution and all different kinds of things. And there was a, a connection that was known between forested watersheds and healthy waterways. Well, when you deforest those watersheds, your waterways become degraded as well. So the whole goal of the Weeks Act and the whole purpose of the Eastern Forests initially was to purchase those lands from those timber companies or private owners that had, uh, that had harvested them and restore forests there so that those downstream water supplies could be protected. Um, so I think that's a really important and really interesting bit of history here. And I think over time, there are now 40 or 45 forests in the East. Um, so it's become a really important component of the national forest system, certainly to the folks uh, who live in the East where there's just not as much public land as there is out here in the West. Um, the last little uh, important act and, and, and time stamp that I wanna uh, mention happened in 1937 with the Bankhead Jones Farm Tenant Act, um, kind of a mouthful. Um, and <clears throat> it did a couple things um, for our purposes. It once again authorized the federal government to purchase lands, only instead of degraded watersheds and upper elevation watersheds, these lands were degraded through uh, because of the Dust Bowl, or, or they were Dust Bowl lands, basically. They had been degraded through farming practices at the time. It plowed up that topsoil. We had several droughts in the 1930s. And as folks know, you know, that soil just blew away um, and created the Dust Bowl. So the federal government purchased these, um, these lands and started rehabilitating them and restoring them. And in 1960, those now restored lands, uh, close to 25 years later, they were officially incorporated into the forest system um, as national grasslands and managed by the Forest Service. Um, right now, we have 20 national grasslands around the country that are part of the national forest system. Um, they do uh, have a lot of grazing on them. Um, as I had mentioned, that's a really important component of that, that multiple use uh, concept that the national forests are managed for. Um, and it made sense at the time in 1960 and, and even in 1937 that the forest service would take over the management of grazing lands. They were actually one of the first federal agencies that set up any management, uh, any grazing management um, laws, policies, et cetera. Um, back in the day before barbed wire fences, it was just open range out west and cattle were, um, <coughs> were causing some problems. And the Forest Service was one of the first agencies that, uh, that implemented some policies to help, help remedy that. And so um, it made a lot of sense uh, to the folks at the time that, uh, that the Forest Service would would stay in the grazing management business and absorb these national grasslands. 
whoops yeah so this oh i went one too fast i thought i maybe did that so you have this history and fast forward to today and this map shows the national forest system basically as it exists today um, all these green blobs are national forests um, you can see there definitely are some in the east particularly in appalachia um, the majority of them are in the west obviously um, and then the yellow uh, blobs or golden yellow blobs those are the national grasslands that i just mentioned primarily in the midwest and in the in the southern great plains texas um, oklahoma kansas those states um, but also up through the dakotas and as you can see, um, the national forest system stretches from Alaska all the way to Puerto Rico. Um, there's actually a national forest in Puerto Rico called El Yunque, which is uh, also not common knowledge, uh, I don't think. Um, and it has an interesting story I'll touch on very briefly. The King of Spain actually set that forest reserve aside um, when Puerto Rico was still uh, part of the, the Spanish kingdom. Um, and uh, Currently, Puerto Ricans take a, a huge amount of pride in El Yonque. They really love it. Um, it provides water for them, like many of these forests, um, and also abundant other resources. It's super diverse. There's like 200 species of plants and trees that, that, uh, that exist on that forest. All told, the national forest system is 193 million acres, which is just immense. Um, there are 175 units, which is an administrative term for a national forest or a national grassland. Um, some of them are combined, they're managed uh, you know, together. So the, the, the Custer Gallatin is a good example or the Absorca Beartooth. They used to be two different forests administratively, they got combined. So that number of units changes a little bit over the years, but basically there's 175 units, uh, 193 million acres, um, and it goes, you know, basically all over the country. I think there are seven states uh, that, or eight states that don't have a national forest or grassland in them. So it, it really covers most of the U.S. When I worked at the National Forest Foundation, uh, we used a statistic uh, that's true that that um, seven out of ten Americans live within a hundred miles of a national forest. So it really does touch uh, many Americans, obviously. So here's where we start to see some of that diversity of landscape that I was talking about. And these captions um, that you see are actually from the book as well with these photos. So down in Arizona, you got the Coconino National Forest, um, which does not look much like the forests here in Montana um, or maybe like a forest at all, um, but is obviously part of the system. Um, You've got uh, the Ocala National Forest in, in Florida, Central Florida, uh, the southernmost uh, national forest in the continental US. Um, amazing uh, freshwater resources. This is Silver Glen Springs, which is a freshwater uh, spring. Uh, manatees come in here in the wintertime um, to, to um, bask in the warm water uh, and to get away from, from uh, the ocean, which gets a little bit cool um, in the wintertime for them. I mentioned grasslands. This is the Dakota Prairie grasslands, um, not too terribly far from you all, um, but still a pretty different landscape from what you uh, are used to there outside of Billings. Um, but obviously it does not look anything like a forest. There's not a single tree in this photo, um, but still a compelling and, and beautiful landscape in its own right. I mentioned El Yunque. Uh, here's a, a photo of, of that forest and you can just see the lush, uh, the lush vegetation there and the biodiversity uh, just in this photo alone. Um, a little farther west from us, down Highway 90, um, you've got the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area, which is a really cool landscape. Um, it's, it's pretty interesting. It's different uh, in its own way from all the other national forests. Um, it's primarily managed by the Forest Service, but they manage it in partnership with Oregon State Parks, um, Oregon Department of Transportation. There are um, several towns, like full-on towns, that are scattered throughout the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area. Um, it's divided up into all these different management zones. Um, and the Forest Service co-manages this broader landscape with uh, the Columbia River Gorge Commission. Um, and it's just a really unique and interesting landscape um, and interesting designation that came about in, um, gosh, I think it was the late 70s or early 80s. I, I have the dates in the book because I tell the story, but I don't remember them off the top of my head. Um, I also mentioned the Angeles. Um, this is a really cool landscape um, just east of Los Angeles, 15 million people. It's definitely one of the most urban forests in the country, um, but it's also a really neat you know, landscape in and of itself. It's got my cat here is uh, making an appearance briefly. Um, it's a uh, it's a chaparral ecosystem, which is, uh, which is actually a Mediterranean ecosystem that you see in Greece and Italy and, and Mediterranean countries. Really neat landscape. 
And then down uh, again in Arizona, you've got the Coronado, which has uh, a forest of saguaro cacti, um, very different from the pine trees and stuff that we have here in Montana. Um, I'm going to keep going through a couple more of these just because I get, I love this. I think it's so cool, just the different landscapes. You know, we think of the Midwest as farms and cornfields and, and flat ground. Well, there are plenty of national forests in the Midwest that, uh, that will change that perception, including the Shawnee. Um, this is Garden of the Gods. This is in Illinois. Um, and I just think it's a really cool spot. And then, of course, you've got the eastern forests. Um, I grew up in Maine. The White Mountain National Forest is in New Hampshire, a little bit of it in Maine. Um, you've got these, you know, hardwood forests. And then as you rise in elevation, you get some conifer forests. You can see the fall colors in this photo. Um, really neat landscape there as well. And then finally, my backyard forest um, and a photo that really represents what I think a lot of folks think of when they when they hear national forests. Uh, this is the Lolo and uh, just a beautiful forested scene on the Lolo with these uh, large trees and pine trees, etc. Oftentimes when either at the National Forest Foundation or, or now when people ask me about national forests, it's often easiest to sort of describe them in contrast to national parks. Um, most people know about national parks, you know, there's America's Best Idea, Ken Burns documentaries, you know, if you are an Instagram follower, you know, there's so many photos from national parks. Um, but they're really quite different. And so I think it helps to understand national forests by sort of understanding them in contrast to national parks. So I'm just going to kind of move through some of these bullets pretty quickly. Um, national parks embody that vision of preservation, um, which was really articulated, or at least historians tend to credit that articulation uh, to John Muir, that sort of famous American Scottish naturalist um, who founded the Sierra Club, um, who went camping with Teddy Roosevelt. And, and got him to establish uh, Yosemite and, and some other national parks um, back in the day. Um, whereas national forests embody a vision of conservation that was articulated by Gifford Pinchot. And I'll build on that in just, in just a moment in the next slide. Um, the next bullet sort of covers that a little more in depth. You know, national parks are managed to preserve the ecosystems, the wildlife, the views, recreation opportunities. National forests are managed for those multiple uses. They're more of a working landscape timber harvesting, grazing, also recreation, but very different. You're not going to see any, any timber harvesting in a national park, obviously. Um, the Forest Service predates the National Park Service by about 11 years, um, and it is about twice as big, um, which makes sense because it manages uh, more than twice as much land. Um, the National Park Service manages about 85 million acres of land, and the Forest Service manages 193 million acres of land, so more than double the size. So just from a landscape perspective, um, it's, I think, pretty clear how, how, how different they are and how much bigger the national forest system is. Um, when you look a little more specifically at some of the, the recreation infrastructure and opportunities on national forests, again, you start to see that size difference. Um, there's 160,000 miles of trails on national forests. Um, almost 100,000 of those are non-motorized. 60,000 of them are open to ATVs and, and um, motorcycles and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and 31,000 of them are in designated wilderness areas. Um, you compare that to about 12,000 miles of trails on national, on, in national parks. Um, and then lastly, the road systems are so vastly different. And this is driven a lar in large part from uh, that timber harvesting. Timber companies built roads into these lands to harvest timber. Um, they were actually paid to build roads in addition to getting um, some money for the logs that they cut. Um, so there was, a, in some ways, a bit of a perverse incentive for them to build maybe more roads than they needed to. Nonetheless, there are 350,000 miles of roads on national forests. Um, it's like 11 times, I think, the size of the interstate highway system. So, you know, if you've driven from Billings to, <clears throat> to Missoula or farther west, you know, that takes a long time going, uh, even going, you know, 80 miles an hour. Um, and you're covering what, maybe, what, four or 500 miles or something like that. There's 350,000 miles of roads on national forests. It's just staggering. Another way that national forests and national parks are, are different, but work together is that many of our national parks, and particularly some of our most iconic ones, are surrounded or bordered by national forests. Um, and this is particularly true out west. Um, this is part of that public domain legacy and, and part of the way that these, uh, these systems were created uh, under different you know, administrations and through Congress. 
Um, but I, I, I like this image here because I think it really highlights um, certainly a, a landscape that's close to you all. This is the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. The dark green square and the little thumb down there, that's Yellowstone Park and Grand Teton. Um, and then the lighter green are the national forests that surround that. There's five of them. Uh, they cover three different states. Um, and by and large, the Park Service and the Forest Service work collaboratively to manage this entire landscape as an entire ecosystem. Um, and so this is pr probably one of the best examples of how national parks are surrounded or bordered by national forests, but there's a list here of plenty of others that are also um, likewise bordered by, by national forests. Um, and they create buffer zones, you know, wildlife don't respect these human-made boundaries. Um, the bison issue is, is a big one in your neck of the woods. Um, but nonetheless, um, it's just, I think it's just an interesting and, 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 and neat component of the way that these landscapes uh, have kind of been divided up. Whoops, I'm moving a little fast here. My, I got a touchy mouse. Um, so I had mentioned John Muir, Gifford Pinchot. Here's a photo of each of them from right around the same time. They were contemporaries. Um, they both uh, knew Teddy Roosevelt. Pinchot was more of a confidant. Um, I think Muir knew him. They went camping. They did a couple things together, but they weren't they weren't quite as close as as uh, as Gifford Pinchot and Teddy Roosevelt were. But um, I just like to show this photo because I think it, it helps a little bit. Um, and I had mentioned that concept of conservation that Gifford Pinchot articulated, and that and that kind of is the the foundational um, concept of how national forests are managed. Well. He's known for this quote, and it, it comes from a letter that he wrote in 1905, and it's kind of an instruction to the forest rangers back then, where um, he's trying to help them figure out how to determine one use over another a uh, national forest. If you got somebody who wants to graze and somebody who wants to do something else, how does that ranger determine which of those uses is the most appropriate? And so Pinchot borrowed from um, an English philosopher, a guy named Jeremy Bentham, um, who had created the concept of utilitarianism, which is a, a moral philosophy that says something is good when it benefits the most people that it can. So Pinchot took that, he kind of modified it, adapted it a little bit. And this quote um, has sort of been, been so closely associated with Pinchot um, for the last hundred years that it's almost impossible to separate the two. Um, and the quote, I'll read it, is where conflicting interests must be reconciled. The question shall always be answered from the standpoint of the greatest good of the greatest number in the long run. And that's really what Pinchot envisioned for the national forests. You could have these multiple uses. You could have timber harvesting and you could have water, healthy watersheds. You could have recreation and you could have grazing. You could have these different uses if we just did it in a balanced and, and I guess maybe he didn't know about sustainability, but today we might call it a sustainable way. Um, and so that concept, whether or not the Forest Service has implemented that as well as they could over the years, it's definitely foundational to the agency and to our national forests. Keep an eye on the clock here. Um, I like to throw this photo in, in right here in this presentation because we spent a little time talking about the national parks. Um, this photo is from the Maroon Bells uh, Mountains on the White River National Forest in, uh, in Colorado. And I think, you know, hopefully you folks have been up to Glacier. Um, I think this rivals any view in Glacier that you're going to get or any view in, in any of our national parks. So I like to put it in here to kind of, again, really hit home that point that just because they're not national parks doesn't mean that our national forests don't contain some pretty stunning landscapes. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, one of the first chapters in my book is called No Forests, No Water, the story of the Eastern forests. And I'll talk a little bit about that story and about that chapter right now. So this photo is actually in the book and it's from a flood in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania from 1907, 1908. And this flood was blamed on deforestation of those forested headwaters that I talked about um, because those trees weren't there to slow that rainwater down to allow that water to percolate into the soil. Um, and they weren't in the stream anymore because you know the streams had been cleaned out. That water, when it rained, it just rushed down the river and flooded Pittsburgh. So it was one of the, that was one of the events that really highlighted the need to reforest these landscapes. Um, so here's a photo of John Weeks, who I mentioned earlier. He's from New Hampshire originally, um, but uh, made some money in Boston, became a legislator from Massachusetts. And he was the one who found that, that hook with the Interstate Commerce Clause to be able to authorize the federal government to purchase those private lands. 
which they did, and they reforested. And now we have uh, second, third, even fourth growth forests uh, throughout the east. And as you walk through those forests, they, they feel pretty old. And those trees are, are pretty big, and, and they're pretty healthy. Um, I'd like to include this photo in here because uh, it shows that humans aren't the only uh, species that rely on national forests for water. Um, I was fortunate enough to snap this photo at Georgetown Lake, actually on the Beaverhead Deer Lodge National Forest one morning. I was out paddle boarding and, and had my camera and my telephoto lens with me and a couple of blue moose were off in the woods and they came out, one of them came out and I think he probably drank from that lake for a minute straight. It was pretty cool. I snapped a whole bunch of photos, it was fun. Okay, <clears throat> the you can't reforest <laughs> a, a landscape without having trees to plant on that landscape. So the next chapter in the book that I talk about is called uh, is the seeds of reforestation, the art and science of growing trees. Um, and this image is from the Coeur d'Alene nursery, which is actually uh, over in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, not too far from where I'm at in Missoula. Um, and it shows these uh, seedlings planted in a, in a bed outside. Interestingly, I think the Forest Service's <clears throat> tree planting program it didn't begin in the West. It didn't begin necessarily as a result of wildfires, though that is now why they, they do most of their reforestation. It began with this guy, Charles Bessie. He was a professor of horticulture at the University of Nebraska, of all places, uh, and a professor of botany. Um, and he was convinced in the early 1900s that the Great Plains was once forested and that it could be again. So he uh, was able to convince um, some folks in the Department of Agriculture to get him some seedlings um, and to, uh, to be able to try and experiment to grow trees. And so they did that. Um, Teddy Roosevelt set aside some land in Nebraska, um, the Dismal River Forest Reserve. Um, it's now part of the, the National Forest of Nebraska. Um, and Bessie and his crew uh, started planting and experimenting with planting. And so that really is the, the genesis of the Forest Service's tree planting program. Um, today, they maintain six nurseries around the country, like the Forest Service nursery, or excuse me, like the Coeur d'Alene nursery that I just showed a picture of. Um, and they grow literally tens of millions of seedlings a year in each of these nurseries. It's an amazing operation. Um, a little cl or close to Missoula, but up in Plains, Montana, um, there's a little nondescript plot of land off of Highway 200. If you've been up that way, you might have driven by it. It's called the Plains Tree Improvement Area or the Plains Cone Orchard. And it's another element of the Forest Service's reforestation program. No longer do um, the young, nimble um, outdoors people go out and climb trees to collect cones, to produce seeds, to produce trees. The Forest Service maintains these cone orchards where they have all these trees in plots separated enough so that they don't crossbreed. They're all labeled. They all come from certain elevations. Um, and they're all kind of the best of the best, at least genetically, the best of the best trees that they have found over the decades. And they grow these trees specifically to harvest the cones. They then separate the seeds out of those cones in seed extractories. Uh, and then they, uh, they store them in these huge walk-in coolers where they're frozen uh, below zero or below freezing temperatures. And when they need, uh, when they need to, to get them out on a project, um, they pull them out, they plant them, um, and they wait a year or two, depending on, on just what that particular civil culturist wants to do. And, uh, and they send them out to the forest and they get planted. So it's a really cool program. Um, it's amazing in scope and scale. It's a neat mashup of kind of old school technology and modern technology. Um, and it's one of the stories that I tell in the book. Moving on, and I know I'm talking fast. Um, so I hope you're all sticking with me. I appreciate it. I'm going to have a sip here real quick wet my whistle and keep on trucking. Um, the next chapter in my book talks about um, those grasslands that I had mentioned earlier. We've got 20 national grasslands and one really unique uh, unit of the national forest system. It's called Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie. Um, often mispronounced as Meadwin or Midwin, uh, which makes sense when you when you look at it phonetically. Um, but it's pr pronounced Medewin and it comes from actually a Potawatomi uh, term, a Native American term, um, which referred to uh, a society of healers. Um, and, and that'll uh, hold some relevance here in just a second. So before I talk about Medellin, I want to talk briefly about the other grasslands. And I mentioned it earlier. You had the Dust Bowl. We had, you know, terrible um, human suffering and ecological disaster from the Dust Bowl. The Forest Service eventually took control of a lot of those grasslands. 
um, once they had been restored and now manages them as grasslands. Uh, and they provide a pretty remarkable economic benefit to the country um, today and some cool recreation opportunities as well. Um, so, you know, this slide obviously shows what used to be. Um, and now we've got those 20 grasslands. Back to Medewin, which is a more modern but still kind of parallel story to, to restoration and redemption as those grasslands and as those eastern forests that I mentioned earlier uh, that, that came into the system after the Weeks Act. Medewin is about an hour south of Chicago. It's in Illinois near a, a town called Joliet, Illinois. Um, any Blues Brothers fans out there might recall that, uh, that the Blues Brothers came from the Joliet prison, which is still there um, actually. And um, I think both Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi, well, Dan Aykroyd might be Canadian, but I think John Belushi maybe was an old Chicago guy. So nonetheless, they came from uh, the Joliet prison. Um, but it was also known back in the day for the Joliet Arsenal, which was a huge munitions factory, two of them actually. One built TNT, manufactured TNT. The other factory put the TNT into bombs. Um, it was created by the Department of Defense uh, around World War II so, because we didn't have um, the... <clears throat> the munitions manufacturing capacity that the government thought that we needed. So they bought up all these small farms in our south of Chicago and created this uh, 20, 30,000 acre um, military industrial complex where they manufactured, I think, close to 2 billion tons of TNT from World War II up through Vietnam. In the late 70s, early 80s, the Department of Defense decided they no longer needed this facility, and so they wanted to get rid of it. And they ended up giving it to the Forest Service. Um, which accepted it and which embarked on a process that's still ongoing of turning it into a native tall grass prairie. Uh, Illinois was once covered by tall grass prairie, uh, as was much of the sort of eastern part of the Midwest. Um, there's three kinds of prairie, tall grass, short grass, and mixed grass. Um, as you move west, you get shorter grasses and mixed grass because you get less rain. But the tall grass prairie was in Illinois. And so the Forest Service is now really hand planting this tall grass prairie. They have volunteers who come out, they harvest seeds from these seed beds. You're maybe starting to see some, some recurring themes here. Um, they planted these seed beds where they can harvest these native prairie plant seeds. They, can, uh, they have a, a seed extractory there. Um, they pull those seeds out of those plants, they store them just like I mentioned for the seedling reforestation program, and then they plant them out uh, on the ground. And they are they're restoring this 20,000 acres back to um, back to a native tall grass prairie, which is a huge undertaking. Um, tall grass prairies are incredibly diverse. There are hundreds of hundreds of plant species in a single acre of tall grass prairie. So to restore that back, it's not quite as quite as simple as planting you know 30, 50 trees per acre. You're planting hundreds of different species of grasses and flowers and all this stuff in tight tight you know, tight units. Um, so it's just a massive undertaking, but it's a really cool one and a really interesting story, again, of that restoration and of that uh, a kind of redemption and rebirth um, that I think a lot of the stories of the national forests have, actually, when you start to look into them a little bit more deeply. Um, one really cool component of Medewin is a project that I got to help with a little bit when I worked at the National Forest Foundation. Obviously, bison used to live in, uh, in, in you know, the Great Plains, um, including Illinois. They no longer do. Uh, however, at Medewin in 2016 or 17, I think it was, um, the National Forest Foundation, the Nature Conservancy, and Medewin partnered up to bring a herd of 27 bison, 23 uh, cows and four bulls um, from a, a private rancher in South Dakota. These were genetically pure uh, bison um, to Medewin. We built a special pasture for them. And, uh, and it was part of an experiment to see how bison might um, passively restore the tall grass prairie. They graze a little bit differently than cattle. Um, there had been some cattle grazing at Medewin over the years, um, but they really wanted to see if bison would help the, uh, accelerate that restoration process. So the bison are, not, are still out there doing their thing. Um, uh, however, there's no longer 27 of them. Um, now there's close to 90 of them because they have been, uh, they've been reproducing and doing really well. Um, and they're a big draw, you know, there's 3 million people that live in Chicago and, uh, a few years ago, probably, uh, you know, four of those three million knew what Medewin was. And uh, because of the bison and some of the publicity generated, uh, a lot more folks are coming down and visiting, which is a good thing. Okay. Um, the next chapter in the book is called The Original People's Lands. And it's probably one of the sadder chapters in the book, um, it, it, although it does end on a note of optimism. Uh, it talks about the 
history of, of the West in particular and how our federal government um, basically just took all the land from Native Americans. Um, it's not a story that we need to get into in, in, in too much depth right now. Um, this photo is from the Badger Two Medicine area, which, which folks may have heard of. It's up on the Lewis and Clark National Forest, um, just east of Glacier National Park, um, and just south, I think, or just southwest of the Blackfeet Indian Reservation. And it is uh, th where the Blackfeet people come from. It's their, it's their ancestral homeland. Um, it's kind of their church, if, if it's, that's an awkward uh, metaphor or, or awkward description, but it's really their origin story is from uh, this area. And for decades, um, even though they live right next door and they use this area, they had no voice in its management. Um, that's changed now. Um, in part through some uh, legal action to, to remove some leases, some oil and gas leases that were placed on this land under the Reagan administration. Um, and now the, um, the Blackfeet are working directly with the Forest Service to manage this landscape. And there's the law that uh, Senator Tester or a bill that Senator Tester is trying to get passed um, to permanently uh, protect this area as a, as a uh, I think it's called a national heritage site um, and to limit some of the, the use of this area. So um, you can still go in there and, and you can still hike and you can still uh, recreate on it. It's still open to the public. The law hasn't been passed yet, but even if it, if it is, um, you'll still be able to go in there, um, but you won't be able to you know, use, use ATVs, things like that. Um, and it just represents that shift that's happened in the last few years, maybe the last couple decades, where the Forest Service managed lands that were once owned by the tribes um, and managed those without any consultation with the tribes at all. And now that's starting to change. Um, also, obviously, over time, the tribes lost a lot of land, um, not just land uh, in the way that we think they, do, they would have when they signed treaties and, and were put onto reservations. But after the Dawes Act that allowed um, uh, basically non-tribal members to purchase land um, in a reservation and that allotted all the land in the reservation to different tribal members, 160 acres each, there were all these surplus lands because there weren't enough tribal members for the entirety, for the allotment to work for the entirety of that particular reservation. And a lot of those surplus lands were actually purchased by the federal government and brought into the federal estate, into national forests. The reason for that was because it could have been sold to private interests where they probably would have been heavily timber harvested, et cetera. And so folks in the federal government at the time, and this happened um, basically from the 1920s, I think uh, on, um, they didn't wanna see those lands uh, end up in, in sort of industrial harvesting uh, uh, processes. So, so they brought them into the federal estate, but it still reduced uh, the overall land holdings of Native Americans to a big degree. Um, the, the Black Hills is certainly one of the more notorious stories of uh, Native Americans being promised something um, through treaties that, that they didn't end up getting, um, and the Black Hills National Forest is now, um, you know, part of the federal, the, the federal estate and part of the, the national forest system. Um, there are some great examples of some early partnerships between Native American tribes and the Forest Service. Um, huckleberry picking and, and Native-only huckleberry camps um, are one example. Uh, this happens to be from the Kootenai up in Northwest Montana, um, but there are others out in the Pacific Northwest where the Forest Service negotiated um, tribes the, the exclusive right to harvest huckleberries in, in certain areas of the forest. Um, and there was a really cool project um, back in the, the CCC era in the New Deal where the Forest Service um, managed an all Native, an all Alaskan Native uh, CCC crew that restored totem poles that had fallen into disrepair up in Alaska, um, primarily in the Panhandle. Um, and so it was a really neat program because these carvers, these old old carvers, were able to not only um, restore these totem poles but also pass those totem carving skills on to the next generation and do some kind of some training, which was pretty cool. So I, I like to highlight a couple of those positive stories and things really have changed um, now. There's an Office of Tribal Affairs uh, within the Forest Service that works directly with tribes. Um, there's much more openness to traditional ecological knowledge that Native Americans have that they can share with scientists and others. Um, there's more acceptance of, um, of the, the use of fire and prescribed fire, which is something that Native Americans were, were really adept at back in the day and, and really maintained the health of forests. Um, take a breath um, before I keep rocking and rolling. 
we're doing now eh, we're running a little tight on time mark i'm gonna bang through this last chapter and then i want to make sure we got a little time for questions um so the next chapter in the book is on recreation, which is a huge component of the national forest system. Um, there's 170 million visits annually on average to the national forests. Um, a lot of those are from ski areas. Uh, I think Red Lodge is probably on a, on a national forest. It's, I think it's on the Custer Gallatin. Um, and recreation is just a huge driver. Um, it's also a challenge to manage. Um, you know, unlike national parks, you don't go through an entrance gate to get onto a national forest. You don't pay for your week pass. You don't talk to a ranger. Um, you just show up at a trailhead and you head off. Um, and so the Forest Service is challenged to manage recreation because they don't want to be the recreation police. They don't have enough staff. They don't have enough capacity to be out there telling everybody exactly what to do and where to do it. So they rely on us, on the recreationists and the groups that we create, the hiking groups, the climbing groups, the camping groups, the skiing groups, to, to help educate our members and educate others on how to recreate responsibly. Um, and it's a, it's a huge issue, actually. It's interesting, certainly COVID has shown us that um, indoor spaces are less safe uh, than, they, than they used to be, or at least they're perceived as such. And so there's been a huge uptick in, uh, in people heading outdoors, um, not just to national forests, but to national parks and to state lands and to all sorts of places. And uh, it's creating some conflict, but personally, um, I think it's great. I think the more people out there, the better, um, even if they need a little bit of education and, and uh, aren't quite doing things in, in quite the right way. Um, a couple of years ago, I was super fortunate to get down and be able to get up uh, into the into the Absorca Beartooth um, and do some some backcountry skiing at a yurt up there. And this is a photo of our crew up there. Um, what an amazing landscape you guys are I live close to. It's so cool down there. What a what a cool spot. Um, I'll cycle through a couple of more of these. You know, this is the Chinese Wall, the Bob Marshall Wilderness, and the Flathead, and and uh, Lewis and Clark National Forests. Um, this is a, a photo from the east. This is from the White Mountain again, um, and it just kind of uh, evokes some of the infrastructure that exists on uh, national forests. Um, there's an old cog railway that still takes tourists up to the top of Mount Washington, um, which is on the, the White Mountain National Forest. Um, and roads. I mentioned roads earlier. Um, they're not only a way we access national forests and recreation opportunities, but they also serve as their own recreational opportunity for scenic driving, for, for gravel mountain biking, for uh, ATV use and OHV use and stuff like that. Um, there are a couple other chapters in the book. I talk about wilderness um, and how wilderness gets designated and how three gentlemen, um, Arthur Carhart, Bob Marshall and Aldo Leopold, who all worked for the Forest Service at one point in their careers, mostly in the 1920s and 1930s, how they had a major impact on the formation of the concept of wilderness and on um, how wilderness, um, how the Forest Service sort of managed wilderness even before the Wilderness Act in 1964. Um, that's a fun story to, uh, to tell. Um, I talk a little bit about what uses are allowed, what uses aren't allowed. Um, again, highlight some more photos. This is up in uh, the Okanagan Wenatchee and the Alpen Lakes Wilderness in Washington. Um, wilderness isn't just a Western phenomenon. It, uh, it, it's, it's all over um, on all sorts of public lands as well. It's not just a national forest system uh, phenomena. This is the Dolly Sods Wilderness from West Virginia on the Monongahela. Um, and of course we got the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness. Um, can't really talk about wilderness without talking about Alaska, um, which is just massive and has uh, the Tongass National Forest is 17 million acres. It's the biggest forest in the system, um, and it's just absolutely huge. I mean, it dwarfs Yellowstone, um, I think 7.7 .7 times uh, larger than Yellowstone. Um, and then my personal, one of my personal favorites, the Bitterroot Selway, um, just south of me here in Missoula, just a gorgeous landscape. Uh, wildlife, I cover wildlife, and to do that, I talk about citizen science, I talk about how the Forest Service manages wildlife habitat and not wildlife populations. That's left up to the states. Um, and then, of course, you got to have a couple of cute photos of some cute creatures. And it's not all about uh, critters. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, of uh, flora out there. This is a bristlecone pine tree on the Inyo National Forest. Um, these trees live up to 5,000 years old. There is a tree on the Inyo that is 5,000 years old right now, which is mind-blowing to me. Um, and then there's the Pando clone on the Fish Lake. This is a, an Aspen stand that is a clone. These are all the same exact genetic organisms. They've cloned uh, themselves for, I think, tens of thousands of years. It's considered one of the largest uh, organisms on the planet. It's a pretty cool spot. 
I talk about wildfire, certainly a subject that we're all pretty familiar with here out west. Um, I focused that story on the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area and a fire that happened there in, in 2017 called the Eagle Creek Fire. And a lot of the wildfire policy um, stems from the Big Burn, which folks are probably familiar with. If you're not, um, I would definitely encourage you to read Timothy Egan's book called The Big Burn or The Great Burn, I think maybe. Um, it's an amazing book, tells an amazing story. Um, it's just really fascinating. That was a huge 3 million acre fire in 1910, killed 85 people and changed the Forest Service's policy about wildfire um, for decades until really the Yellowstone fires when they changed it again and started letting fires burn more often. Um, this is a pretty common scene in these parts. And then I finish with uh, a chapter on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, I talk a little bit about outdoor media and how outdoor media uh, is starting to do a better job of representing uh, diverse faces in catalogs and in film. Um, you know, 10 years ago, if you opened an REI or a Cabela's catalog, you were probably only going to see pictures of fit white people. Nowadays, that's pretty different. Um, and I, I want to end um, this actually presentation and end this chapter. Um, with uh, with the the awesome I think awesome news that the Forest Service is now led by its first African American chief. Um, a couple years ago, a couple months ago, uh, Randy Moore, um, who was the the head of of Region Five, which is California, uh, within the national within the Forest Service, he was uh, appointed as as the chief of the National Forest System and the U.S. Forest Service, which I think is really cool. So there's some some good movement institutionally, at least within the Forest Service, to uh, to start to, um, to have you know, people of color in leadership positions, which I think is really great. Um, this is an old photo from 1930s of a girls club, uh, Forest Service Girls Club. They help plant some, some trees, I think. Um, and when the Forest Service does outreach events and in places like, like the Tuskegee down in Alabama, which uh, incidentally is the smallest national forest in the country at 11,000 acres, um, pretty different from 17 million. Um, you know, you get all kinds of folks who come out and uh, certainly Smokey Bear is a big draw. So with that, um, I am going to have another sip of my beverage and I'm gonna let Mark uh, hopefully ask me uh, some questions that you all have and, uh, and I'd love to answer them. I, I'm happy to answer questions about the book process, about national forests, about other public lands, um, whatever you might have. So thank you very much. Again, I really appreciated this opportunity. I had a lot of fun working through all this. I hope you folks enjoyed it. Oh, great. Let's see, I'm not sure if you've released. Um, oh yeah, I can stop sh screen, screen sharing. There we go. There we go, okay. Good deal. Uh, yeah, thanks. My pleasure. Hello, Thank you all. Bernie. Hi, Bernie. Do you guys know each other? Not yet. Yeah. Hi, Bernie. Okay. You ought nice to get to, to know you. Bernie. All right. Great. He's a terrific uh, poet, master of eco poetics, which is a oh cool a thing to get into, but uh, amazing. Um. So. Well. I, one of the things that impressed me, I guess I, I you know, when I first saw the, uh, first saw your, we first visited about um, uh, hosting this, I was thinking that you were going to focus more regionally, you know, kind of like it's going to be in Montana and all in the West and, you know, you come out of Missoula, you know, and all this other kind but, uh, you know, it really surprised me, the scope of the whole, I mean, the, the, the entire national scope that you cover in this. It's impressive. It's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was important to me. Um, you know, I think, again, um, similarly, probably to national parks, you know, I think people think of public lands as a predominantly Western phenomenon. And, you know, it probably is true from a land size standpoint. Um, but I don't think it's true from a cultural history standpoint. Um, and there were so many stories that I think are, were really interesting to tell from those eastern forests and, and from those grasslands and in some of those midwestern landscapes that I really wanted to make sure that they were included in the book. I didn't want it to be, you know, a story of western forests exclusively, um, though that may have been a little bit easier and and in some ways, um, you know, maybe maybe even more fun just because I, you know, those landscapes are our landscapes out here are pretty captivating and pretty interesting, um, but there there's just so much 
rich history and, and so much, uh, so many people who are passionate about these landscapes across the country. Um, you know, you want to get into a recreation debate that puts some of ours, um, that makes some of ours look, look minuscule, go to the Nantahala Pisgah outside of Asheville, North Carolina, and, you know, mountain bikers and hikers there, they're coming to fisticuffs uh, for some of this travel management planning stuff that the forest is doing, um, and boaters, and, you know, it's just, it's intense in some of these places, um, and I think the part of that's driven from scarcity. You know, I took a great class at the University of Montana, I talk about it a little bit in the book, and <clears throat> Martin Nye, the professor in the forestry department, talked about how all natural, well, all natural resource uh, conflicts are driven by the concept of scarcity. You know, when, when one person thinks they're running out of something, that drives conflict. And often people can think they're running out of the opposite things, and, and that drives controversy. And so when just public lands in general are scarce, that drives, I think, passion for, you know, voicing your opinion about what public lands there are and how they should be managed. And I think we see that in the East, particularly in some of these recreation uh, communities like Asheville and, and others. Well, I'm thinking we're uh, about out of time, probably need to wrap this up. Uh, do we have any other questions at all? Uh, okay. Well, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, we'll, we'll hope to see your book soon. I, Looking forward to looking at it myself. So great. Well, thanks so much. I really appreciated it. Um, I, I have a website, gregmpeters.com. If you have any questions after the fact and you want to chat, feel free. My email's on there. Feel free to shoot me an email. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks again. I really appreciated the chance to chat with you all. And uh, all right. All right. okay, bye. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye bye. bye, -bye.